Thank you. Thank you, Luigi. It's such a pleasure to be with you all. And um, thank you for the invitation. Um, so, like Luigi said, I'd like to, uh, in our time together today, base my reflections around some of the paintings of Stanley Spencer. Um, Spencer returns time and time again uh, to paint biblical gospel scenes in his own uh, contemporary local context of Cookham uh, in the first half of the 20th century. And in these paintings, he is negotiating how the gospel, how the faith relates to the world that we imagine is beyond it. And in this way, his work offers much, I think, that has the potential to be compelling and exciting and persuasive as we consider how we ought to engage as Christian communities in our own localities, in our own Cookham. Um, but his work also just as vividly acts out, I think, a certain temptation um, that we need to be aware of when it comes to imagining our relation to church as churches to what is outside of us. And both of these reasons, um, his insight as much as his flaws, make him, I think, a really productive person to be in conversation with as we consider the question of how the church might live well and fully and truthfully in the places in which we dwell. Um, so to give you a bit of a sense of structure, I'm going to begin by offering um, a very brief introduction to the work of this remarkable and uh, quite peculiar artist, Stanley Spencer. And then I'll go on to offer a theological reading of some of his paintings, focusing here on three thematic strands. So place, imagination and hope. Um, and I'll do that before offering a bit of a critique of his work and his approach. Um, so I hope you all have a handout with um, those headings and some images in front of you, uh, so you'll be able to follow along. But I'll start by just telling you a little bit about Stanley Spencer before we get into some of his works. Um, sounds like uh, you might already be quite familiar, so I will keep this on the brief side. Uh, he was an English painter born in 1891, uh, born in Cookham, which is this small village by the Thames in the south of England. It's a place of great importance to him. And he describes Cookham as a village in heaven. And even when he takes up a place at a very prestigious um, art school, the Slade School of Art in London, Spencer continues to live in Cookham and he commutes in every day. And in fact, his friends give him the nickname Cookham. Um, it's such a, an integral part of who he is, this place, and that will become clear when we look at his work. And at the beginning of his career, Spencer is um, a real visionary. And along the way, like so many artists, he gets caught up producing um, uh, works of art for him, landscapes, uh, by virtue of commercial necessity. Um, and his com compositions become a little more claustrophobic and a little bit less vivid, but they never quite lose their originality. Um, and Spencer really doesn't fit easily into artistic categories or schools. Um, as you will have gathered thinking about the, the, date, uh, the date at which he was born, the First and Second World Wars have a, um, a profound impact on Spencer. And he himself um, is posted with the ambulance service in Macedonia. And when he comes back from war, he um, is offered several commissions for memorials. So the, the themes of memorials and the themes of war are something that really has an impact on his work. He remains uh, an independent artist his whole life, deigning not to join any of the artistic um, uh, movements of the period. And his works, you know, most particularly interesting to me, um, often express a really curious and quite unconventional Christian faith. Um, and we glimpse this most explicitly in the paintings he produced depicting biblical scenes, like I mentioned, um, as if occurring in Cookham, this place that he was from, uh, continued to live and loved so much. So let me talk you through just a few examples of these depictions that are on your handout. So the first is a painting called The Resurrection Cookham. And it's a painting of the final resurrection happening in Stanley Spencer's own churchyard, the churchyard um, of uh, the Cookham, the church that he went to in Cookham. And you can see God pictured 
as Trinity just under the church porch, under those um, white flowers. And uh, God there, pictured as Trinity, is watching as people emerge from their graves. And the people who rise from their graves are specific people that Spencer knew. Um, friends, former landlords, village people, people he went to the pub with. And he includes himself as one of those who rises. So that's that's him uh, in the centre, in the nude, um, just reclining there on a tombstone, kind of um, just under uh, the church porch. And he also includes his wife, Hilda, um, who is front just to the left uh, with all those flowers around her. So the work is suffused with personal significance. Let me offer you another example, this time of Christ carrying the cross. So that's the second image on the handout. In the biblical account, of course, Christ carries the cross through Jerusalem. But Spencer sets the scene in the village of Cookham. Um, and this painting was said to have been partly inspired by watching builders carrying ladders down a Cookham street. So you can see those builders carrying ladders there, uh, just to the right. Um, and the shape of the ladders formed a cross and the resonance apparently struck Spencer. It's also said to have been informed by a newspaper report of Queen Victoria's funeral, um, which recounted how men and women wept as the funeral procession moved through the streets. So again, you get this sense that the stuff that is in Spencer's mind is really infusing his interpretation of this biblical scene. And the brick house you can see um, in the left there is Spencer's own family home. And the ivy clad cottage to the right is his grandmother's. So the anachronism is explicit. Um, people are looking out of windows, net curtains are blowing about, people are dressed in the clothes of their day. And once again, what Spencer is presenting us with is a scene integral to the faith, placed in the setting of Cookham, amid Cookham's geography and Cookham's people, located in the time of his present day. I'm going to offer you one final example. And this is Spencer's rendering of the Last Supper. So it's the third image there. And Christ sits before the wall. Uh, with his disciples ahead of the giving of communion and the devastating announcement that one of the disciples will betray him. But the wall in front of which Christ sits is not just any wall, it's the wall of the grain bin in a Cookham malt house. And the other disciples are ranged across the sides of this plain table and their limbs form this um, a strongly marked pattern in the center there. And it's interesting to note that none of the disciples have been given halos, as they often are in artistic depictions of this scene, um, which lends them again a sense of the, I guess it, it suggests the ordinariness of these people, an ordinariness similar to um, that of the people that Spencer knew and was acquainted with. So with the addition of this third example, you will have certainly grasped this preference of Spencer's to locate the most sacred of gospel moments in the village that was his home. Um, there are other paintings I could show you to demonstrate this quirk of Spencer's, but the point is clear enough for now um, for us to reflect on it. What does Spencer show us in this preference, in this belief that the most, that the most sacred moments are set in for him, the most ordinary of settings? What is he showing us here? And to answer this question, that's where I'm going to turn, as I mentioned, to these three foci, place, imagination and hope. Um, so let's start with place. As Spencer locates the most sacred moments of his faith in the village of Cookham, what he asserts most fundamentally is, I think, his love for the place. And why do I think this preference of his equates to a kind of love? Well, what Spencer seems to say in his decision to place the gospel in Cookham is, here is a place to be believed in. Here is a place where no less than God and God's work have been and will be. Here is a people who are caught up in that work. You think this is any old pub, but really it's a pub visited by Christ. You think these are any old builders, but really they are builders caught up in the life of the Lord. 
And you think this is any old church porch, but really it's the church porch where God, three in one, dwells together in love. This is how we see what we love, with the utter conviction of the beloved's remarkableness, with eyes that see their preciousness, and with a profound belief in their potential. We can see the beloved's place in the story of all that is historic and important and valuable in the world. And it's exactly this that Spencer seems to be doing. He sees this place with eyes which see its significance, which see it's being touched by and visited by the drama of God's story. I really like this definition of love that the theologian Joseph Piper gives us. He says that to love something or someone is to say, I am glad you exist. To see that a something or a someone matters in a way that is irreplaceable. I'm glad you exist. And placing the gospel in Cookham seems to me to be Spencer's way of saying exactly this. I'm glad Cookham exists. Cookham is irreplaceable. Cookham is where God has been and God is and God will be. And this is the first place in which I believe Spencer is calling us to something of profound significance when it comes to imagining our relationship with the places in which we are situated. Do we love our places? Do we love the streets and sights and sounds of where we live? And this love is not a love that says, these streets and sights and sounds are my favorite or even to my preference, but a love that says, for all these streets and sights and sounds might be, for however grubby or run down or ordinary or dull they might be, I am glad they exist. I believe this place to be precious. I believe this place to be where God has been, where God is, where God will be. I believe it to be a place that matters infinitely. Can we say with Spencer that we believe that our own cookums, wherever they might be, are equally places where God has been and is and will be? Do we believe that? The second element I want to draw out of Spencer's decision um, to place the most sacred of moments in the most ordinary of settings um, to locate the biblical scenes he does in pubs and churchyards and so on, is the significance of imagination. So here I'm moving to um, that second emphasis of imagination. Clearly, what we are looking at when we look at these images is the exercise and consequence of Spencer's imagination. He imagines what the churchyard might yet become, the center of the final resurrection. He imagines the church porch as the place where God cradles God in this wonderful Trinitarian image. He imagines the malt house as the place where the disciples gather and talk and eat and wonder. He imagines the builders caught up in the drama of Christ's crucifixion. There's a really wonderful poem by Francis Thompson who lived on the streets of London in the Victorian period. Um, he died homeless, uh, he died addicted to opioids. And that poem there that I have in mind speaks to me of exactly the kind of imagination that Spencer demonstrates to us in these paintings. I won't read the whole poem, but let me share two stanzas which are also on your handout. O world invisible, we view thee. O world intangible, we touch thee. O world unknowable, we know thee. Inapprehensible, we clutch thee. Yea, in the night, my soul, my daughter, cry, clinging to heaven by the hems, and lo, Christ walking on the water, not of Genesareth, but Thames. Thompson sees the Thames as the river Genesareth, the river walked on by Christ. And elsewhere in the poem, he describes Jacob's ladder as pitched between heaven and Charing Cross Station in London. His is an imagination which senses the invisible world, the intangible world, 
in our midst. And what it helps me realize is that Spencer, like Thompson, is one attuned to the depth of what surrounds us. The idea that things are not only what they are. The sense that whatever it is that we come into contact with, whether a particular view, a person, a friend, a tree, they are more than what we immediately see. There is a moreness, an excess, something that goes beyond our understanding, a margin that is beyond our grasp. And it's this sense that Spencer presents to us when he shows us a world that is concrete and familiar, but which, to borrow the words of Thompson, touches the invisible and intangible. And here I think we find another point where Spencer calls us to a posture that is useful as we consider our relationship as church to what is beyond us. And that is as follows. When we consider the streets and places and people beyond the walls of our church, we ought, I think, to alert ourselves over and over again to the fact that all is more than at first it seems. We ought to train ourselves to sense and perceive and be ready to receive the moreness of what we encounter. We ought to expect to be surprised by the liveliness or the potential or the profundity of those people and places and causes that lie beyond our four walls. To think of Spencer, the builder might just turn out to be the one who stays with Christ in Christ's suffering. To think of Thompson, Charing Cross Station might turn out to be where Jacob's ladder is pitched, leading us to heaven. This imaginative expectation that the invisible might be hidden in our midst seems to me to be highly important in nurturing in us a receptivity to the world. The third element I want to address is that of hope. When Spencer paints biblical scenes in Cookham, when he sees the resurrection take place in his own churchyard, I think he models a kind of hope. He says, look, this is a place where God is at work and the spirit is moving and God will come again. It's right here. And this is most explicit in that first painting I mentioned, um, The Resurrection, a painting in which he shows God known to all with no judgment, no fear, only joy, only lightness. It's a picture of the end in which there is no division, no separating sheep from goats, in which beloveds are re reunited with one another, in which there is such an air of peace and resolution and rightness. And what's interesting here is just how, in a way, naive the quality of this hope might seem to us. It has such simplicity to it. It isn't bogged down by detail or consideration of trade-offs or particularly nuanced um, in what it's imagining. And it is in this sense that something about Spencer strikes me as having a similar manner to that of the prophets. There's a wonderful study of the prophets and their characteristics and mannerisms, what kind of brings them together as uh, a type of person, which was written by the Jewish scholar Abraham Heschel. And Heschel describes the way in which prophets are distinctively one octave too high. They're a little bit much, one octave too high. And while we are prone when we hope to be quite modest and a bit timid and rather sensible, the prophet comes along and feels things and sees things and says things with great and resting intensity and simplicity, getting straight to the heart. Now, we're not all called to be prophets, perhaps, and there is an important place for those of us who uh, see the complexity of tasks and how muddied the waters are and how complicated the good and it's being obtained can be. But Spencer reminds us of the value, I think, of the simple hope, the simple hope for things to be good, for there to be joy, for light to come. And I, I'm struck by how easy it is in 
the busyness of life and the complexity of the world's problems to forget how deeply we simply want things to be good. It's easy to forget that we all in our own way just want things to be good. That in the hiddenness of our own hearts, we long for peace and love and reconciliation. However strangely or sometimes perversely we manifest those desires. Spencer's work then says this to me, don't forget the simpleness of your desire. Don't forget that you want things to be good. Don't neglect the simple voice that you are prone to call naive, who shouts out, this is wrong. Let's keep going. There's goodness to come. There's goodness to come. And it's especially wise, I think, to take Spencer seriously here as we think of how we encounter our neighbours. To assume that they, like me, have that simple desire for the good. To assume commonality. To assume that shared point of departure. That we are all hoping for what we believe to be good. Holding out like a child for what we take to be wrong to pass away. And no doubt the visions we each hold of what the good means and looks like. And our identification of what exactly is wrong and our understanding of what the character of peace has will differ considerably and in complex ways. But it's worth, I think, holding that complexity with the assumption that there is a simple desire that holds us together. The childlike part of us that just wants the good, that hopes against hope. In this assumption, we find a place to encounter our neighbors, which begins in mutuality and good faith. So in reflecting on Spencer's peculiarity in placing scenes from, scenes from the Bible in his beloved home of Cookham, we've encountered three dynamics that might help us think about how the church can relate to its community beyond. First, his paintings show us how good it is to love the places in which we dwell. And they show us that love of a place is not about the place meeting our taste or preference necessarily, but about that place being a place we believe in, a place where we believe God to have been, a place we believe God is, and a place we believe God will continue to come. Second, his paintings rely on imagination, an imagination undergirded by the conviction that things are not only what they are, that what we encounter in the world is always greater and deeper and livelier than our surface reading can permit us to appreciate. The pub might just be where the disciples are gathering. Third, his paintings recall to us the simplicity of prophetic hope, a hope that holds out like a child terms uh, like a child for what is good. His work reminds us that beyond the complexity of the problems we and our world face, there is rooted in us a simple want for what is good. Assuming this hope in our neighbours, I suggested, makes for a solid place to start. And yet there is also, if we stay with Spencer, something I find troubling about his activity in these paintings. And here I want to offer a brief critique of what he's up to. For all the ways his vision of the place in which he lives and the people he encounters is steeped with love for them and hope in them, we might also at once be a little wary of the confidence with which he places these others into his own version of the gospel stories. Were the builders who passed his window that day anything like the kind of people who would wish to be caught up in the gospel drama? Were his neighbours uh, depicted at the resurrection happy to be depicted there? There's something about Spencer that can be seen somewhat to overbear, even to possess his, um, the people and places he loves. I wonder if he slips into neglecting the otherness of his neighbours, their essential mystery their distance from him, which must remain intact even in love if it is not to suffocate. And when it comes to our own relationship to our neighbours, the same temptation lies in wait for us. How do we avoid subsuming the other into our own story, projecting onto them our own sense of who they are and our own sense of what they're about? 
And it's here that I want just briefly to mention the theology of Simone Weil. For what we might say is missing in Spencer's paintings with respect to the neighbor is fundamental to Weil's theology of the neighbor, and that is attention. Simone Weil was a French philosopher and theologian who died in 1943. And much of her rather unusual and certainly quite unsystematic theology returns time and again to the notion of attention. Attention, she wrote, consists of suspending our thought, leaving it detached, empty, and ready to be penetrated by the object. It means being empty, waiting, not seeking anything, but ready to receive in its naked truth the object which is to penetrate it. In attending to the other, the soul must empty itself of all its own contents in order to receive into itself the being it is looking at in all his truth. So we have a vision of attention before the other, which is about wide open receptivity and openness to the truth of the other, where there is no trace of projection or seeking, just radical receptivity. And this attention, Vey thinks, is the substance of love, not only our love of God when we attend to God, but our love of neighbor as we see the neighbor as they truly are. And what's interesting is that this attention is not for her the same as warmth of heart. It's not just tenderness or interest in the other or delight in them. It's something else, something harder. And I wonder if it's this kind of attention that is the intervention that Spencer might benefit from. For all the usefulness of the love he has for the place he lives and the richness of his imagination uh, and the directness of the hope he has, I am left feeling when I look at this work that it needs to be inflected more seriously with the kind of attention that Vey speaks of. Really, who are these people in themselves? What are these places in themselves? Before Spencer paints his faith into and on top of them. This is the first step that might properly precede everything else. Asking, listening, attending. What is the world like before my own hope and imagination comes to frame it? In Spencer's work, I want to say then that what we see modeled are a host of useful ways of negotiating a relationship between the church's life and what seems outside it. He shows us how to love places in believing that they are places where God is at work. He shows us how to imagine places and neighbours as more than what they might be with an eye to the potential that always takes us beyond how they might appear on the surface. And he shows us how to hope simply for the good and inducts us into believing that others too, like us, hope simply for the good, setting us up for mutuality and good faith. But I also, as I've said, think his work recalls to us by way of its lack, the significance of attention first and foremost, as informing how we ought to love and imagine and hope in what surrounds us. Now, let me try finally to ground some of this reflection in the practice of community organizing, um, which I know you are thinking through as a congregation. The church that I attend here in London has been involved in the practice of community organizing for a number of years now. And I do sense some significant parallels between the kind of relationship that Spencer draws us to and the kind of principles upon which organizing rests. So Spencer, as I've said, seems to say, to love a place, we need to believe in it. And community organizing invites us to do exactly that, to look at our locality and believe in it as a place where goodness is and might yet be. My church is involved in a campaigning for a community land trust, which is a form of affordable housing. Um, and we want this community land trust to be built on some unused land just up the road from our church. And this campaign started by walking around the parish and noticing a bit of unused scrubland and believing that that scrubland could be something important, something valuable, something with such wonderful potential. And as I think about it, as I was reflecting on this, it struck me that that walking around, that wandering around the parish was kind of a form of love, a bit like Spencer's, trying to see and discern its potential, to believe in the goodness that the place might foster, 
to see a bit of scrubland and say, yeah, we could we could build something amazing there. Spencer seems also to be saying that we ought to imagine what is around us in a sense as more than it may seem to be alert to the moreness of what we meet and encounter. And while in community organizing, that's taken very seriously um, in, in regards to how people are encountered. The fact that people who may not seem on the surface like leaders, like people of power or influence, are often identified in the practice of community organizing as the real movers and shakers of a community. I've seen many times people who all too easily could be overlooked, recognized through community organizing as people of great power. There's a sense in which it trains us to see the more that people are and can offer. And Spencer, as we've seen, also seems to show us this simple hope that teaches us to assume that others hold this hope too. And community organizing in likeness builds alliances across different institutions, relies um, in this way on finding the shared goodness that people across difference nevertheless have in common. It finds the connection of hope and it starts its work there. And Spencer finally, um, as I've said in my critique, alerts us to the problem of not attending, <laughs> the problem of projecting too much onto the people and places in our midst. And while one of my favorite aspects of community organizing is that it begins in listening, in long campaigns of listening to people, it enacts a form of attention, correcting that part of us, um, that part, uh, like that part of Spencer that wants too quickly to say that we know what's best here, that we have the answers. And in these respects, what we find in Spencer's paintings, for better and for worse, shows us a way of relating to what is beyond us that resonates with the practices of organizing. And if I can offer just in the final minute or two, uh, a theological word that might hold some of this together, it would be this. And here I borrow the language of Rachel Muirs. Christ, she writes, is not a conquering idea, but a weak word a word that comes into the world and is vulnerable to all manner of mishearing, who comes into the world among us rather than above us. And in this sense is closer to a whisper than a shout. This word does not have the dialect we expect of power and dominance, but is a little voice among us that we must listen to. And what this means is, if Christ is a weak word rather than a conquering idea. What this means is that Christ has to be searched for. Christ has, has to be listened out for very closely. Christ has to be expected on unusual places. Christ might be hiding right in our midst. And the way of seeing that Spencer inducts us into, so long as we add to it that quality of deep attention, and the practices that community organizing can induct us into are ways of looking for Christ out there instead of in here, searching for Christ, listening out closely for Christ, looking in unexpected places for Christ, looking right in our midst for Christ. These are ways of taking seriously where and how the person of Jesus positions himself, hides himself, and lets himself be known. I'll end there, thank you for your attention. <laughs>